Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Good morning to you all. Uh, I um, I'm very happy to be here, uh, but also I'm very happy to see uh, the veterans here uh, and many other brothers and sisters uh, who witnessed a dark day in our recent history, but also who turned that dark night into a bright day within a matter of uh, 10, 12 hours. And I want to share some thoughts with you along the lines Dr. Uh, Albayrak raised uh, about what the July 15 coup uh, meant for Turkey and what it means for the larger, larger world, including uh, the Muslim world, and what kind of implications it will have in the future for the relationship between civil society, governance, religious ideas, citizen activism, and responsible and wise political leadership. But uh, let me uh, begin uh, by first of all thanking uh, University of Marmara for hosting us here, the president, the dean of the faculty, and uh, Professor Kandur for organizing uh, this event. And I think it is important that you know we gather together to talk about this issue because I know a lot of people, especially in the Western world, want us to forget what happened that night because uh, it just doesn't work for them to remember what happened that night, those, those uh, films, those scenes that you have seen. You hardly see them in the Western media. There is almost a deliberate attempt to censor uh, this kind of image taking place, reaching large publics, uh, large audiences around the world, uh, because they explain what happened here, and they explain the context in which we are now dealing with the aftermath and the, and, the, and the actions that we are taking against the coup plotters. It all makes sense when you know the full picture. And a lot of people in the Western world, again, have resisted, even to this day, to understand and acknowledge the magnitude of what happened that night. They present it as a small event, a small group within the Turkish army tried to um, overthrow the government, uh, but it failed, so the story is over, let's move to the next one. In fact, we reject that interpretation. We believe that what happened that night will be remembered. We will never forget our martyrs. We will never forget our veterans. We will never forget those people who made it possible for us to go through that dark night. The coup, and so you have two people here, two types of people here. You have the coup plotters, some of whom are in jail, some are on the run. And then we have the coup stoppers, some of whom are here. And uh, believe me when I say this, that you are among the living heroes of this country, of this century, of today. And uh, I'm sure you will hear from them, but also take this opportunity to meet with them. At, on that night, uh, when Dr. Esra was talking about how her children reacted uh, or was trying to make sense of what was happening that night. I remember my own daughter, 12-year-old daughter, uh, kept asking me about one word that she heard for the first time in her life, the word coup. I said, Daddy, what, it mean? what does coup mean? Of course, in the middle of all the things that we were trying to do at that time, so I'm trying to explain to her what a coup is, and then she turns to me and says, so these are our soldiers? because she was seeing some scenes that night, uh, and it's so hard to explain that yes, these are supposedly our soldiers using our own tanks and F-16s against our own people. It's very difficult to understand. So we will never forget what happened that night. Another interesting thing, of course, as I said, while we lived through that pain and agony as a nation, um, there were some really bright spots, bright moments, remarkable experiences, bravery, courage, uh, displayed by ordinary people. People, the very people that make what we call civil society. And they are the ones that really stop this coup. Of course, with the leadership of President Erdogan, and I will come to that, and why his leadership in this country as Prime Minister and President for the last 14 years has played uh, a key role in preparing the people to stop such an onslaught on our democracy. Had it not been for President Erdogan's leadership that gave confidence, but also respect and self-esteem to the ordinary Turkish people, this coup 
will not have been stopped the way it was. Had it not been for his courageous leadership that night and firm belief uh, in the people, in the ordinary people, this coup maybe will have succeeded. And this was probably the idea that the coup plotters had. And if you look at some of their interpretations that night and their surprise that uh, the coup did not succeed, their reaction was that, how is that possible that people are getting to the streets? Our people, they were saying, are not courageous enough. They cannot fight tanks and F-16s and soldiers. When they see a soldier with a gun, they just look away to run. Uh, and that just turned out to be not the case. In fact, uh, as I said, the coup stoppers here and, and thousands and thousands of them uh, show to the world that in fact, uh, with nothing but with, with their bare hands, as you see here in this picture, and with nothing but slippers, they can stop a coup. And they, I think, uh, gave a remarkable example to any nation around the world who, that believes in democracy, in rule of law, in freedom. So in that regard, I think uh, July 15 uh, night and the aftermath has also shown to the world how strong the Turkish civil society is. Uh, you don't have to have fancy names or uh, halls of uh, 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 conferences and things like that. People just had the faith. People had the courage to take to the streets to stop because they understood immediately what was happening, especially when they saw their president, their leader, uh, on TV, yes, on FaceTime, that's true, first, but then on TV, that uh, this was their moment to rise. This was their moment uh, to prove to the world that they will sacri sacrifice uh, their lives without hesitation for their country, for their flag, for their unity, for their democracy. One of the funny moments that night, uh, when you look back now, is that for the first time, many of us, our generation, not to speak of our own children, experienced such a thing as a coup. We read stories about military coups in Turkey in 1960, 71, 1980, tanks rolling, soldiers taking over, uh, this emergency uh, edicts uh, prepared by the military being read on TV. We heard these things, we read about these things, but we never experienced it. So when on that night, many people didn't know what to do. But almost intuitively, they figured out how they were going to respond to this coup attempt. And one of the funniest things, I think, uh, about that night was that one of the things that was most searched on Google that night was how to stop a tank. Because, you know, tanks are tough. You cannot stop them with your bare hands or with some stones or some sticks. And I've seen people, you know, uh, hitting a tank with a stick uh, with the hope that it will stop. Um, so they were searching on Google how to stop a tank. And they came up with some uh, incredible ideas that, you know, if you block the, the exhaust, uh, you know, uh, then uh, the tank will stop. And they did it and they succeeded. Uh, or how, how do you stop uh, an F-16? And some were saying that, well, they fly for two hours. After that, you know, they will run out of gas. You will see. Wait for two hours, and then we will take over the F-16. It's remarkable, you know, how people came up with these ingenious ideas. Uh, it shows, again, the remarkable bravery and courage uh, that, in fact, uh, even in the darkest moment, there is a way out. And I think that night, uh, this great nation proved to the world uh, that uh, we love our democracy and freedom more than anything else. And uh, we will die for our nation. We will die for our land. And we will stop this coup. And they, they show this to the world that it is possible. And uh, they, they made it. They made it possible. So uh, again, I'm very proud to be part of this nation. But I know a lot of people around the world uh, see this nation uh, with admiration uh, for what they did on that night. Now, uh, but there is a dark side, obviously, to what happened that night. The Gulenist cult that organized, planned, and executed uh, this coup attempt has to be exposed. I know for a lot of people, including many brothers and sisters around the world, it's difficult to understand uh, the true nature of this uh, cult. That's why 
some people tell us in the West especially that, you know, how come such a movement group uh, can infiltrate state institutions for years uh, and then suddenly they go for a full-fledged military coup? It doesn't make sense. So they raise questions. Well, was it planned before? Who did it? And I think all the evidence that we've gathered so far, all the testimonies that are emerging and, and, and all the other evidence, material evidence that has been collected, show clearly who is behind this coup. And there is no question. Uh, in Turkey, there is a large consensus uh, about the fact that the Gulen people and the Gulenists within the army, within the Turkish bureaucracy, judiciary, and other parts of the state are behind this coup. And this consensus across the political board, it's not just about, it, it's not just supported by people who support the government or President Erdogan, but it's across the society. And I think it's important to remember this, this consensus because a lot of people miss out on that. Now, coming to the Gulenist cult, how they uh, were able to infiltrate state institutions uh, and, and eventually plan uh, for the bloodiest coup attempt in our history. Uh, we need a, a, just a short background uh, on this, uh, what I call a power-grabbing messianic movement. The Gulenists, uh, obviously Gulen himself, began his preaching, his training uh, in the 1960s, 50s and 60s. He claimed to have, uh, to be the follower of Said Nursi, a respected scholar of Islam who lived in 19, uh, well, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, but uh, he developed his own way of thinking about religion, about social organization, and then apparently, gradually, he came to believe that he had this divine mission, that he was the Mahdi of this century. And many of his followers, in fact, believe that he is the Mahdi. They say this very openly, that he speaks to God. He takes his orders from uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, that he is divinely guided, he is protected. So this messianic idea or ideology that underlies much of the Gulenist thinking, in fact, is on display. You can see this from open sources in their closed circle meetings, etc. cetera. You, 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 you see them talk about this uh, issue all the time. Now, so there's something strange here that why will someone who uh, claims to serve God by serving people, first of all, make these claims? Secondly, can you imagine any religious organization that claims to be for education, for peace and dialogue, have large investments in business, in banking, in intelligence, in state bureaucracy, in judiciary, in international relations, in media. Rather than being a religious community or charitable organization, the Gulenists have become a criminal empire. Which kind of civil society institution or religious organization will seek to place its people in key positions in state institutions, starting with intelligence and police chiefs? Why will plot, if, if they claim that they are a religious organization, why will, do, uh, why will they do this kind of uh, infiltration into state institutions? It doesn't make any sense. In this sense, the Gulenist cult is a unique case. We have had many religious organizations in our history or movements that, turned, that took a bad turn. Yes, they, that made mistakes, that's true. Or they became very powerful, threatened state authority, etc but you've never seen anything like this Gulenist cult that has planned all these things for uh, four decades uh, and waited for the right moment to make the final strike. And when you look at their overall ideology, they didn't see any problem with killing more than 240 people on the streets. I mean, when we're looking at the testimonies of those soldiers who actually flew uh, their F-16s that night, who fired at people at the Turkish parliament, they were, they're all saying that the order came from a higher authority that they couldn't resist. So can, you, can you believe that as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an ordinary person, as a, as a Muslim, that you will be ordered to kill ordinary citizens and you will obey that order on the basis of the authority of this lunatic? 
So the, the claim that the Gulen movement is a, is a peaceful religious movement, it's a charitable organization interested in nothing but education and peace and dialogue and, and understanding, etc., is a total lie. Second thing about the Gulenists is, is the fact that not, by not only uh, exploiting religious faith for uh, power and influence, Gulenists have also discovered uh, that by siding with the powerful all the time will serve their interests. You never see them in their political history or in their uh, organizational history taking any clear position on key issues such as Palestine or the Syrian issue or the refugees, the Somalian or Muslims in Myanmar or minorities. You see them always siding with the powerful so that they will be on the side of those who have influence, who have money, who have uh, political power. They did exactly the same thing here in Turkey. In the 1960s and 70s, they supported whoever was in power. They supported uh, all the other governments that came to power. And therefore, the, Mr. Gulen's claim that he has opposed all military coups throughout his life is also a lie. He, sa he said this in a response uh, to an article that I published in New York Times, and he responded two days after. And he said that he has opposed all military coups, he has worked for democracy throughout his life, etc. That is a lie. We, we have not seen Gulen or his followers take a position or condemn the 1980 coup. Has anyone seen that? No. In 1997, during what we call the February 28th process, when the democratically elected government of Nejmettin Erbakan was overthrown by a military coup, by, by a military intervention, Gulen came out very openly and he said, you failed, you should go. And he said this not to the military, not to those who uh, wanted to overthrow a democratically elected government, but he said it to the very government that was elected by the people. So his whole claim that he has been against uh, military coups in his, uh, in his life, etc., is simply not true. Now, putting all this uh, uh, together, the Gulenist cult can only be described as a power-grabbing messianic cult. So their claim to, to peace and dialogue and, and, and friendship and all of that, uh, I think, has gone through the window uh, on that night. We've, uh, we've seen this very clearly. Now, not only, obviously, they try to now defend themselves, but also they run a number of smear campaigns against Turkey, against our president. And I want to share this particular point with you because you know, they do this in probably your own circles in the US, in Europe, uh, in Muslim countries, in Pakistan, and many other places. Why are they running the kind of smear campaigns that they are running, especially against our president? Well, that's understandable. Now he has become their political opponent. They don't like him, etc. But there is one particular trait here, which I think requires our attention. And that is that whole narrative about Erdogan being the dictator. The Erdogan di dictator narrative was in fact formulated and circulated by the Gulenists over the last two years especially, interestingly, after we realized that it was time uh, for this Gulenist cult to move back to its natural borders and stop meddling in state uh, affairs, in intelligence, in judiciary, etc., they immediately began to formulate this and probably they were looking for the best pitch. What will be the best way to discredit uh, President Erdogan? The same president who opened the doors of this country to three million refugees, as uh, Dr. Esra mentioned, at a time, and I have to say this today, when today, as we speak, in Calais, the camps are burning and children have no place to go. Between, they are stranded between France and, and the UK, the two most prosperous countries in Europe and among the top uh, economically top countries in the world, they cannot find a place for a couple of hundred children, refugee children. They are stranded between, in Calais between, uh, between France uh, and the UK. When we open our doors to three, three million refugees from Syria, from Iraq, and we will continue to, to take them uh, as, as they come in. 
So the president who opened up the civil society space, the state uh, institutions to all segments of society, the very president who moved millions of people out of poverty, who established a very powerful middle class, who helped empower civil society, who helped all minorities, not only religious communities, but also non-Muslims, Armenians and Christians and Jews and, and, and many others in this country, who for the first time in their lives, and they say this, and I'm, I'm not making this claim, they say this on their own account, that for the first time in their life, they felt that they are treated equally and honorably as equal citizens of this country. So the very president who has made all this possible is now the subject of this heinous smear campaign by the Gulenists. Why? But especially why the dictator narrative? I think it all makes sense when you look at it from the vantage point of view of what happened on July 15. They put together this dictatorship narrative in order to prepare the ground for the justification of the coup. Had the coup been successful, they would have said, yes, coups are bad, you know, they're, they're, they have no place in democracy, but at least we got rid of a dictator. This is exactly what they did in Egypt. In 10 months, Mursi became a dictator. How is that possible for any leader to become a dictator in such a short period of time? When Mursi, in fact, did not kill a single person, when Mursi did not imprison anyone, when, in fact, Mursi was trying to uh, revamp the Egyptian economy, trying to reach out to Christians and other groups, and but that was not enough. That was not enough. In 10 months, he became a dictator. Remember, it, multiply it with 5, 10, and then you get a, you get a sense of uh, what the Gulenists were trying to do with President Erdogan. They, had, they used the dictatorship argument, which was... Uh, uh, bought by some Western media and some pundits and, and, and analysts and others. And as I said, had the coup succeeded on that night, they will have said, you see, now at least, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the lesser evil question. Yeah, it's bad, but at least, you know, we got rid of, uh, we, we got rid of a dictator uh, in a key uh, NATO country. Now, giving all this, uh, I know Western media uh, doesn't want us to concentrate on these issues. They, they want to move to the next issue, which is what happens in the aftermath of the coup, and I'll come to that. But uh, for a lot of people here in Turkey, uh, the question is still there. And uh, while we still remember what happened that night, we are also trying to figure out who did it and why. And there, there is uh, some soul searching there also. You know, how can such a power grabbing messianic cult emerge, manipulate, and execute the kind of things that they have done? And what we are supposed to do now, what is our duty now to make sure that these things do not happen again in this country? Now, let me turn to uh, the aftermath uh, of the coup. Uh, Turkey is stronger today than it was before July 15. Turkish economy is stronger, Turkish state is stronger, Turkish politics is more unified, Turkish society is more unified. As I said a few days ago to a group of Balkan journalists, had this coup happen in another country, state institutions will have collapsed, economy will have collapsed, society will have been fighting with each other. To the contrary, Turkey remains strong, and only five weeks after this heinous, bloody coup attempt, our president opened the third bridge over the Bosphorus, a major multi-billion dollar project. Only five and a half weeks after the coup attempt, we launched the Euphrates Shield operation to clear our borders from all Daesh elements. And that operation has been going on very successfully. FDI is coming in, foreign direct investment is still, is still coming in. Coming in. Uh, we just held a major uh, uh, forum, uh, World Energy Forum, which brought together heads of states and all the key people uh, in the energy world to, to, uh, to discuss and, and, and decide on, uh, on the future of energy policies. In our foreign policy, in our domestic policy, in, in many other areas, Turkey is stronger today than it was uh, before the July 15 coup attempt. And this is thanks to uh, the brave people uh, of this nation uh, who stopped this coup with their bare hands. 
and there uh, you see the shattering of some orientalist, some even feminist stereotypes about Turkish women, about Turkish society. Uh, you remember the Western media coverage of the so-called female fighters in the ranks of PKK and YPG uh, in Syria and Iraq, how they romanticize, lionize, uh, and idealize those types. They are terrorists, pure and simple. But they were presented as freedom fighters, and especially the fact that they are women probably appealed to some audiences uh, in, in the West. I have never seen, I may, I, I, I may have missed some, but I've never seen any story about Turkish women who that night went to the street, stopped uh, the military coups. Maybe there are some stories published in, but you know, in major, major Western media outlets. I have not seen any emphasis, any, any major stories about this, this woman. The reason is that they do not fit the, the, the stereotype or the, or the ideal type that they have in their minds, that they will never expect it, that ordinary Turkish woman uh, with headscarves or without headscarves uh, will play such a key role uh, in defending democracy uh, in Turkey, in stopping a coup uh, in Turkey or in any uh, Muslim nation. I think the remarkable uh, bravery of our people has also shattered many myths about Turkish civil society. Uh, contrary to, uh, to many uh, claims, uh, Turkish civil society is strong, uh, is well integrated, is well interconnected with one another. And we've seen this again on, on that night. It was really remarkable when they saw their president. You know, they took to the streets without hesitation. They didn't know what was to come. They didn't know if they were going to be run over by tanks, if they, if they were going to be fired at by F-16s. They just took to the streets because they believed in, the, in their democracy, in their freedom, and they also they believed in their leader, that if he's calling on us to take to the streets, now it's our day, it's our job, it's our moment to rise and do what is right. And this is exactly what they did uh, on that night. So it shows, I think, the resilience and strength of the Turkish society as a whole, but also the power of civil society. In the days that followed the coup, uh, for 29 days, uh, people were out on the streets again for democracy vigils. And uh, honestly, in Ankara, during, around our uh, presidential complex, we were telling people to go home. They wouldn't listen to us. In fact, they will get angry with us. Why do you tell us to go home? You know, the danger is not over yet. And I said, look, you know, I'm saying this as a state official. It's okay. You can go home. No, we will not go home. We will stay here. We will protect you. And it was really remarkable. And I think that spirit is still very much alive there. Uh, and we, we need to understand uh, and appreciate and acknowledge uh, this remarkable sacrifice that uh, people have displayed with their lives, uh, with their bodies, with their minds, with their hearts, with their families, with their children. And this is uh, the strength that we have now to deal with this Gulenist threat. Uh, as well as with many other threats. Turkey is the only NATO country that is fighting against three terrorist organizations at the same time today. We have the PKK threat, we have the Daesh or ISIL threat, and then we have the, the Gulenist uh, terrorist threat. And Turkey is the only country in this, in this case. But despite the fact that we are surrounded by war zones from Syria to Iraq to Ukraine uh, and the economic difficulties in Europe and in the region, uh, Turkey remains strong because it has a strong people. Turkey remains strong because it has a strong civil society. Turkey remains strong because it has a wise, responsible, strong leadership. And we will never forget this. Forgetting is equal to betraying the, the memory and the sacrifices of our own martyrs and our veterans who are here. So we will never forget you know, their sacrifices. We will always remember, and we will always tell the stories of that night to our children, and they will tell it to their children, so that this kind of evil never finds another chance, either in this country or elsewhere. Thank you.